I can see by my watch without taking my hand from the left grip of the cycle that it is 8.30 in the morning. The wind, even at 60 miles an hour, is warm and humid. When it's this hot and muggy at 8.30, at I'm wondering what it's going to be like in the afternoon. In the wind are pungent odors from the marshes by the road. We are in, it, we are in an area of the central plains filled with thousands of duck hunting sloughs heading northwest from Minneapolis, Minneapolis toward the Dakotas. This highway is an old concrete two-laner that hasn't had much traffic since the four-laner went in parallel to it several years ago. When we pass a marsh, the air suddenly becomes cooler. Then when we are past, it suddenly warms up again. I'm happy to be riding back into this country. It is a kind of nowhere, famous for nothing at all, and has an appeal because of just that. Tensions disappear along old roads like this. We bump along the beat-up concrete between the cattails and stretches of meadow and then more cattails and marsh grass. Here and there is a stretch of open water, and if you look closely, you can see wild ducks at the edge of the cattails and turtles, and there's a red-winged blackbird. I whack Chris's knee and point to it. What? he hollers. Blackbird! I yell. He says something I don't hear. What? I holler back. He grabs the back of my helmet and hollers up. I've seen lots of those, Dad! Oh! I holler back, and then I nod. At age 11, you don't get very impressed with red-winged blackbirds. You have to get older for that. For me, this is all mixed with memories but he doesn't that he doesn't have. Cold mornings long ago when the marsh grass had turned brown and cattails were waving in the northwest wind. The pungent smell then was from muck stirred up by hip boots while we were getting in position for the sun to come up and duck season open. Our winters when the sloughs were frozen over and dead and I could walk across the ice and snow between the dead cattails and see nothing but gray skies and dead things and cold. The blackbirds were gone then. But now in July they're back and everything is at its alivest and every foot of these sloughs is humming and cricking and buzzing and chirping. A whole community of millions of living things living out their lives in a kind of benign continuum. You see things vacationing on a motorcycle in a way that is completely different from any other. In a car, you're always in a compartment, and because you're used to it, you don't realize that through the car window, everything you see is just more TV. You're a passive observer, and it's all moving by you, boringly, in a frame. On a, motor on a cycle, the frame is gone. You're completely in contact with it all. You're in the scene, not just watching it anymore. And the sense of presence is overwhelming. That concrete whizzing by five inches below your foot is the real thing. The same stuff you walk on. It's right there, so blurred you can't focus on it. Yet you can put your foot down and touch it any time, and the whole thing, the whole experience is never removed from immediate consciousness. Chris and I are traveling to Montana with some friends, riding up ahead and maybe headed further than that. Plans are deliberately indefinite, more to travel than to arrive anywhere. We're just vacationing. Secondary roads are preferred. Paved county roads are the best. State highways are next. Freeways are the worst. We want to make good time, but for us now, this is measured with emphasis on good rather than time. And when you make that shift in emphasis, the whole approach changes. Twisting hilly roads are long in terms of seconds, but are much more enjoyable on a cycle when you bank into turns and don't get swung from side to side in any compartment. Roads with little traffic are more enjoyable as well as safer. Roads free of drive-ins and billboards are better. Roads where groves and meadows and orchards and lawns come almost to the shoulder, where kids wave to you when you ride by, where people look from their porches to see who it is, where when you stop to ask for directions or information, the answer tends to be longer than you want rather than short, where people ask where you're from and how long you've been riding. It was some years ago that my wife and I and our friends first began to catch on to these roads. We took them once in a while for variety or for a shortcut to another main highway, and each time the scenery was grand and we left the road with a feeling of relaxation and enjoyment. We did this time after time before realizing what should have been obvious. These roads are truly different from their main ones. The whole pace of life and personality of the people who live along them are different. They're not going anywhere. They're not too busy to be courteous. The hereness and nowness of things is something they know all about. It's the others, the ones who moved to the cities years ago and their lost offspring, who have all but forgotten it. The discovery was a real find. 
I wondered why it took us so long to catch on. We saw it, and yet we didn't see it. Or rather, we were trained not to see it. Conned, perhaps, into thinking that the real action was metropolitan, and all this was just boring hinterland. It was a puzzling thing. The truth knocks on the door, and you say, Go away, I'm looking for the truth. And so it goes away. Puzzling. But once we caught on, of course, nothing could keep us off these roads. Weekends, evenings, vacations... We have become real secondary road motorcycle buffs and found there are things you learn as you go. We have learned how to spot the good ones on a map, for example. If the line wiggles, that's good. That means hills. If it appears to be the main route from a town to a city, that's bad. The best ones always connect nowhere and nowhere and have an alternate and nowhere and have an alternate that gets you there quicker. If you're going northeast from a large town, you never go straight out of town for any long distance. You go out and then start jogging north and then east and north again, and soon you're on a secondary route that only the local people use. The main skill is to keep us from getting lost. Since the roads are used only by local people who know them by sight, nobody complains if the junctions aren't posted. And often they aren't. When, they're, when they are, it's usually a small sign hiding unobtrusively in the weeds, and that's all. County road sign makers seldom tell you twice. If you miss that sign in the weeds, that's your problem, not theirs. Moreover, you discover that the highway maps are often inaccurate about county roads, and from time to time you find your county road takes you onto a two-rudder, two and then a single rudder, and then into a pasture and stops, or else it takes you into some farmer's backyard. So we navigate mostly by dead reckoning and deduction from what clues we find. I keep a compass in one pocket for overcast days when the sun doesn't show directions, and have the map mounted in the special carrier on top of the gas tank where I could keep track of miles from the last junction and know what to look for. With those tools and a lack of pressure to get somewhere, it works out fine, and we just have, and we just about have America all to ourselves. On Labor Day and Memorial Day weekends, we travel for miles on these roads without seeing another vehicle then cross the federal highway and look at cars strung bumper to bumper to the horizon, scowling faces inside, kids crying in the back seat. I keep wishing there was some way to tell them something, but they scowl and appear to be in a hurry, and there isn't. I have seen these marshes a thousand times, and each time they're new. It's wrong to call them benign. You could just as well call them cruel and senseless. They are all of those things, but the reality of them overwhelms halfway conceptions. There! A huge flock of red-winged blackbirds ascends from nests in the cattails, startled by our sound. I swat Chris's knee a second time. Then I remember he has seen them before. What? He hollers again. Nothing! I holler back. Well, what? <coughs> What's that, baby Griff? <coughs> River! <coughs> just, checking, just checking to see if you're still there, I holler. And nothing more is said. Unless you're fond of hollering, you don't make great conversations on a running cycle. Instead, you spend your time being aware of things and me meditating on them, on sights and sounds, on the mood of the weather and things remembered, on the machine and the countryside you're in, thinking about things as great leisure and length without being hurried and without feeling you're losing time. What I would like to do is use the time that is coming now to talk about some things that have come to mind. We're in such a hurry most of the time we never get much chance to talk. The result is kind of endless day-to-day -day shallowness, a monotony that leaves a person wondering year, years later where all the time went, and sorry that it's all gone. Now that we do have some time and, and know it, I would like to use the time to talk in some depth about things that seem important. What is in mind is a sort of Chautauqua. That's the only name I can think of for it, like the traveling tent show Chautauquas that used to move across America, this America, the one that we are now in, an old-time series of popular talks intended to edify and entertain, improve the mind, bring culture and enlightenment to the ears and thoughts of the hearer. The Chautauquas were pushed aside by the faster-paced radio in movies and TV, and it seems to me the change was not entirely an improvement. Perhaps because of these changes, the stream of national consciousness moves faster now and is broader, but it seems to run less deep. The old channels cannot contain it, and in its search for new ones there seems to be growing havoc and destruction along its banks. In this Chautauqua, I would like not to cut any new channels of consciousness, but simply dig deeper into old ones that have become silted in with the debris of thoughts grown stale and platitudes too often repeated. 
What's new is an interesting and broadening eternal question, but one which, if pursued exclusively, results only in an endless parade of trivia and fashion, the silt of tomorrow. I would like instead to be concerned with the question, what is best? A question which cuts deeply rather than broadly. A question whose answers tend to move the silt downstream. There are eras of human history in which the channels of thought have been too deeply cut and no change was possible, and nothing new ever happened, and best was a matter of dogma. But that's not the situation now. Now the stream of our common consciousness seems to be obliterating its own banks, losing its central direction and purpose, flooding the lowlands, disconnecting and isolating the highlands to no particular purpose other than the wasteful fulfillment of its own etern internal momentum. Some channel deep in deep ending seems called for. Some channel deep ending is, seems called for. Up ahead, the other riders, John Sutherland, his wife Sylvia, they pulled into a roadside picnic area. It's time to stretch. As I pull machine beside them, Sylvia is taking her helmet off and shaking her hair loose while John puts his BMW up on the stand. Nothing is said. We have been on so many trips together, we know from a glance how one, an, one another feels. Right now, we're just quiet and looking around. The picnic benches are abandoned at this hour of the morning. We have the whole place to ourselves. John goes across the grass to a cast iron pump and starts pumping water to drink. Chris wanders down through some trees beyond a grassy knoll to a small stream. I am just staring around. After a while, Sylvia sits down on the wooden picnic bench and straightens out her legs, lifting one at a time slowly without looking, looking up. Long silences mean gloom for her, and I comment on it. She looks up and look, then looks down again. It was all those people in the cars coming the other way, she says. The first one looked so sad, and then the next one looked exactly the same way, and then the next one, and the next one. They were all the same. Oh, they were just commuting to work, I said. She perceives well, but there was nothing unnatural about it. Well, you know, work, I repeat. Monday morning, half asleep. Who goes to Monday work, morning work with a grin? I said. Well, it's just that they looked so lost, she said, like they were all dead, like a funeral procession. Then she puts both feet down and leaves them there. I see what she's saying, but logically it doesn't go anywhere. You work to live, and that's why they're doing it. I was watching swamps, I say. After a while, she looks up and says, What did you see? There was a whole flock of red-winged blackbirds. They rose up suddenly when we went by, I said. Oh, she said. I was happy to see them again. They tie things together, thoughts and such, you know? She thinks for a while, and then with the trees behind her, a deep green, she smiles. She understands a peculiar language which has nothing to do with what you're saying. A daughter. Yes, she says. They're beautiful. Watch for them, I say. All right. John appears and checks the gear on the cycle. He adjusts some of the ropes and then opens the saddlebag and turns rummaging through. He sets some things on the ground. If you never ever need any rope, don't hesitate, he says. God, I think I've got about five times more what I need here. Not yet, I answer. Matches, he says, still rummaging. Sunburn lotion, combs, shoelaces. Shoelaces? What do we need shoelaces for? Well, let's not start that, Sylvia says. They look at each other, deadpan, and then both look over at me. Shoelaces can break any time, I say solemnly. They smile and nod at each other. Chris soon appears, and it's time to go. While it gets ready and climbs on, they pull out and Sylvia waves. We're on the highway again, and I watch them gain distance up ahead. The Chautauqua, that is in mind for this trip, was inspired by these two many months ago, and perhaps, although I don't know, is related to a certain undercurrent of disharmony between them. Disharmony, I suppose, is common enough in any marriage, but in their case, it seems more tragic, to me anyway. It's not a personality clash between them. It's something else for which neither is to blame, and for which neither has any solution, and for which I'm not sure I have any solution either, just ideas. The ideas begin with what seemed to be a minor difference of opinion between John's and me on a matter of small importance. How much one should maintain one's own motorcycle. It seems natural and normal to me to make sure of the small toolkits and instruction booklets supplied with each machine and keep it tuned and adjusted myself. John demurs. He prefers to let a competent mechanic take care of these things so that they are done right. Neither viewpoint is unusual, and this minor difference would never have become magnified, magnified if we didn't spend so much time riding together and sitting in country roadhouses, 
drinking beer and talking about whatever comes to mind. What comes to mind usually is whatever we've been thinking about in the half hour or 45 minutes since we last talked to each other. When it's roads or weather or people or old memories or what's in the newspapers, the conversation just naturally builds pleasantly. But whenever the performance of the machine has been on my mind and gets into the conversation, the building stops. The conversation no longer moves forward. There's a silence and a break in the continuity, and this is as though two old friends, a Catholic and a Protestant, were sitting drinking beer, enjoying life, and the subject of birth control somehow came up. Big freeze out. And of course, when you discover something like that, it's like discovering a tooth of the missing filling. You can never leave it alone. You have to probe it, work around it, push on it, think about it, not because it's enjoyable, but because it's on your mind and it won't get off your mind. And the more I probe and push on the subject of cycle maintenance, the more irritated he gets. And of course, that makes me want to probe and push all the more, not deliberately to irritate him, but because the irritation seems symptomatic of something deeper, something under the surface that isn't immediately apparent. When you're talking birth control, that blocks it and freezes it out is... What blocks it and freezes it out is that it's not a matter of more or fewer babies being argued. It's just on the surface. What's underneath it is a conflict of faith. A faith in empirical social planning versus faith in the authority of God as revealed by the teachings of the Catholic Church. You can prove the practicality of Planned Parenthood till you get tired of listening to yourself and it's going to go nowhere because your antagonist isn't buying the assumption that anything social, socially practical is good per se. Goodness for him has other sources, which he values as much or more than social practicality. So it is with John. I could preach the practical value and worth of motorcycle maintenance to a horse, and it would make not a dent in him. After two sentences on the subject, his eyes go completely glassy, and he changes the conversation or just looks away. He doesn't want to hear about it. Sylvia is completely with him on this one. In fact, she is even more empathetic. It's just a whole, it's just a whole other thing, she says. When in a thoughtful mood, like garbage, she says. When not, they want not to understand, not to hear about it. And the more I try to fathom what makes me enjoy mechanical work and them to hate it so much, the more elusive it becomes. The ultimate cause of this originally minor difference of opinion appears to run way, way deep. Bark it out, Gruff. Bark it out. Bark it out, Gruff. Inability on their part is ruled out immediately. They are both plenty bright enough. Either one of them could learn to tune a motorcycle in an hour and a half if they put their mind and energy to it, and the saving in money and worry and delay would repay them over and over again in their effort. Excuse me. All right. Out you go, baby girl. I remember once outside a bar in Savage, Minnesota, on a really scorching day when I just about let loose. We'd been in the bar for about an hour, and we came out, and the mechanics were so hot you could hardly get on them. I'm starting and ready to go, and there's John pumping away on the Kickstarter. I smell gas like we're next to a refinery, and I tell him so, thinking this is enough to let him know his engine's flooded. Yeah, I smell it too, he says, and keeps on pumping. And he pumps and pumps and jumps and, pump and pumps, and I don't want, and I don't know what more to say. And finally, he's really winded and sweats running down all over his face and he can't pump anymore so i suggest taking out the plugs to dry them off and air out the cylinders while we go back for another beer and my oh my god no he doesn't want to get into all that stuff all that stuff oh getting out the tools and all that stuff there's no reason why it shouldn't start it's a brand new machine and i'm following the instructions perfectly see it's right on full choke like they say full choke well that's what the instructions say well, that's for when it's cold. Well, we've been in there for a half an hour at least, he says. He kind of shakes me up. This is a hot day, John, I say. And they take longer than that to cool off, even on a freezing day. He scratches his head. Well, why don't they tell you that in the instructions? He opens the choke, and on the second kick it starts. I guess that was it, he says cheerfully. And the very next day, we were out near the same area, and it happened again. This time, I was determined not to say a word. When my wife urged me to go over and help him, I shook my head. I told her that until he had a real felt need, he was just going to resent help. So we went over and sat in the shade and waited. I noticed he was being super polite to Sylvia while he pumped away, and meaning he was furious. And she was looking over with a kind of, ye gods, look. If he had asked any single question, I would have been over in a second to diagnose it, but he wouldn't. 
I must have been 15 minutes before he got us started. Later, we were drinking beer again over at Lake uh, Minnetonka, and everybody was talking around the table, but he was silent, and I could see he was really tied up in knots inside. Hey, Bodie Hummer! I'm okay. reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance about a, a dad and his son taking a motorcycle trip across Yesterday, the country. Did I tell you? What's that? Miso. What did Miso do? She peed in your room! Oh! Yes! That little gruffle. That little, that little mother Mito. gruffer. Come here, you little mother gruffer. Mother gruffer. Come on, gruffles. Puppies. Oh. Here she is. This is the little mother gruffer. Oh. All right. See you, buddy. Can you close the door for me? Later, we were drinking beer again over Lake Minnetonka, and everybody was talking around the table, but he was silent, and I could see he was really tied up in knots inside. After all that time, probably to get them untied, he finally said. You know, when it doesn't start like that, it it's just really turns me into a monster inside. I just get I just get paranoid about it. This seemed to loosen him up, and he added, They just had this one motorcycle, see, this lemon. And they didn't know what to do with it, whether to send it back to the factory or sell it for scrap or what. And then at the last moment, they saw me coming with 1800 bucks in my pocket, and they knew their problems were over. In a kind of sing-song voice, I repeated the plea for tuning, and he tried hard to listen. He really tries hard sometimes, but then the block came again, and he was off to the bar for another round for all of us, and the subject was closed. He is not stubborn, not narrow-minded, not lazy, not stupid. There was just no easy explanation, so it was left up in the air, a kind of mystery that one gives up on because there's no sense of just going around and round and round looking for the answer that's not there. It occurred to me that maybe I was the odd one on the subject, but that was disposed of too. Most touring cyclists know how to keep their machines tuned. Car owners usually won't touch the engine, but every town of any size at all has a garage with expensive lifts, special tools, diagnostic equipment what the average owner can't afford. The car engine's more complex and inaccessible than a cycle engine, so there's more sense to this. Where for John's cycle, a BMW R60, I'll bet there's not a mechanic between here and Salt Lake City. If his points or plugs burned out, he's done for. I know he doesn't have a set of spare points with him. He doesn't know what points are. If it quits on him in western South Dakota or Montana, I don't know what he's going to do. Sell it to the Indians, maybe. Right now, I know what he's doing. He's carefully avoiding giving any thought whatsoever to the subject. The BMW is famous for not giving mechanical problems on the road, and that's what he's counting on. I might have thought this was just a peculiar attitude of theirs about motorcycles, but discovered later that it extended to other things. Waiting for them to get going one morning in their kitchen, I noticed the sink faucet was dripping and remembered that it was dripping the last time I was there before, and that in fact it had been dripping as long as I could remember. I commented on it, and John said he had tried to fix it with a new faucet washer, but it hadn't worked. That was all he said. <clears throat> The presumption left was that that was the end of the matter. If you try to fix a faucet and your fixing doesn't work, well, then it's just your lot to live with a dripping faucet. This made me wonder myself if it got on the nerves, this drip, 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 week in, week out, year in, year out, but I could not notice any irritation or concern about it on their part. And so concluding, concluded they are ju just aren't bothered by the things like dripping faucets. Some people aren't. What it was that changed this conclusion, I don't remember. Some intuition, some insight one day. Perhaps there was a subtle change in Sylvia's mood whenever the dripping was particularly loud and she was trying to talk. She was she had a very soft voice, and one day when she was trying to talk but above the dripping and the kids came in and they interrupted her, she lost her temper at them, and it seemed that her anger at the kids would not have been nearly as great if the faucet hadn't also been dripping when she was trying to talk. It was the combined dripping and loud kids that blew her up. What struck me hard then was that she was not blaming the faucet, and that she was deliberately not blaming the faucet. She was ignoring the faucet at all. She was suppressing anger at the faucet, and that goddamn dripping faucet was just about killing her. But she could not admit the importance of this for some reason. Why suppress anger at a dripping faucet, I wonder? Then that patched in with the motorcycle maintenance, and one of those light bulbs went over my head, and I thought, Ah, it's not the motorcycle maintenance. It's not the faucet. It's all of technology they can't take. And then all sorts of things started tumbling into place. I knew that was it. Sylvia's irritation at a friend who thought computer programming was creative. All their drawings and paintings and photographs without a technological thing 
in them. Of course, she's not going to get mad at that faucet, I thought. You always suppress momentary anger at something you deeply and permanently hate. Of course, John signs off every time the subject of sacral repair comes on, even when it's obvious he's suffering for it. That's just technology. And sure, of course, obviously. It's so simple when you see it. To get away from technology out in the country and the fresh air and sunshine is why they were there on the motorcycle in the first place. For me to bring it back to them just at the point and place where they think they finally escaped it just frosts both of them. Tremendously. That's why they, the conversation always breaks and freezes when the subjects come up. Other things fit in, too. They talk once in a while in as few pain words as possible about it or it all, as in the sentence, there's just no escape from it. And if I asked from what? The answer might be the whole thing or the whole organized bit or even the system. Sylvia once said defensively, well, you know how to cope with it, which puffed me up so much at the time. I was embarrassed to ask what it was and so remained somewhat puzzled. I thought it was something more mysterious than technology, but now I see that the it was mainly, if not entirely, technology. But that doesn't sound right either. The it is a kind of force that gives rise to technology, something undefined but inhuman. Mechanical, lifeless, a blind monster, a death force. Something hideous they are running from, but no, they can never escape. I'm putting it way too heavily here, but in, at least, but in a less emphatic and less defined way, this is what it is. Somewhere there are people who understand it and run it, but those are technologists, and they speak in inhuman language when describing what they do. It's all parts and relationships of unheard of things that never make any sense, no matter how often you hear about them. And their things, their monsters, keep eating up land and polluting their air and lakes, and there's no way to strike back at it, and hardly anyone to escape it. Any way to escape it. That attitude is not to come to. That attitude is not too hard to come to. You go through a heavy industrial area of a large city, and there, there it all is: the technology in front of it, high barbed wire fences, locked gates, signs saying no trespassing. Beyond, through sooty air, you see ugly, strange shapes of metal and brick whose purpose is unknown, and whose masters you will never see. What's it for you don't know, and why it's there, there's no one to tell. And so all you can feel is alienated, is strange, as though you didn't belong there. Who owns and understands this doesn't want you around. All this technology has somehow made you a stranger in your own land. Its very shape and appearance and mysteriousness say, get out. You know there's an explanation for all this somewhere, and what it's doing undoubtedly serves mankind in some indirect way, but this isn't what you see. What you see is the no trespassing, keep out signs, and not anything serving people but little people like ants serving all these strange, incomprehensible shapes. And you think even if I were part of this, even if I were not a stranger, I would be just another ant serving the shapes. So the final feeling is hostile, and I think that's ultimately what's involved with this otherwise unexplainable attitude of John and Sylvia. Anything to do with valves and shafts and wrenches is part of that dehumanized world, and they would rather not think about it. They don't want to get into it. If this is so, they're not alone. There is no question that they have been following their natural feelings in this and not trying to imitate anyone, but many others are also following their natural feelings and not trying to imitate anyone, and the natural feelings of very many people are similar on this matter. So that when you look at them collectively, as journalists do, you get the illusion of a mass movement, as anti-technologically, anti-technological mass movement, an entire political anti-technological left emerging, looming up from apparently nowhere, saying, stop the technology, have it somewhere else, don't have it here. It is still restrained by a thin web of logic that points out that without the factories there are no jobs or standard of living, but there are human forces stronger than logic. There always have been, and if they become strong enough in their hatred of technology, that web can break. Clichés and stereotypes such as beatnik or hippie have been invented for the anti-technologists, the anti-system people, and will continue to be. But one does not convert individuals into mass people with the simple coining of a mass term. John and Sylvia are not mass people, and neither are most of the others going their way. It is against being a mass person that they seem to be revolting. And they, rev and they feel that technology has got a lot to do with the forces that are trying to turn them into mass people, and they don't like it. So far, it's still mostly a passive resistance. Flights into the rural areas when they are possible and things like that, but it doesn't always have to be this passive. I, dis I disagree with them about cycle maintenance, but not because I am out of sympathy with their feelings about technology. I just think that their flight from and hatred of technology is self-defeating. The Buddha, the Godhead, resides quite as comfortably in the circuits of a digital computer 
with the gears of a cycle transmission as he does at the top of a mountain or in the petals of a flower. To think otherwise is to demean the, is to demean the Buddha, which is to demean oneself. That is what I want to talk about in this Shatakwa. We're out of the marshes now, but the air is still so humid you can look straight up directly at the yellow circle of the sun as if there were smoke or smog in the sky. But we're in the green countryside now. The farmhouses are clean and white, fresh, and there's no smoke or smog. 